Thank you so much for this invitation. I am really looking forward to our conversation this evening. Thank you, Sabina. So um, before we, when I started this project on thinking of decolonizing biology or more particular decolonizing botany, I quickly realized that we need a different story about colonization and how we talk about science and the ways in which science was shaped and formed through um, colonial expansion. And so I've been thinking about how to narrate, could we go to the next slide? How we could narrate the history of the biology of our planet, not as a story of extraction, exploitation, extinction, of devastation and damage, of pathology and degeneration, which is often the story we tell about colonial botany. And so in this new work, I'm trying to explore new genealogies that we have forgotten. Um, in particular, I'm uh, trying to move away from the usual debates of the two cultures of the humanities and sciences that were once separated and now new interdisciplinary work will bring them together to produce, a, you know, a new kind of knowledge production. What I feel is lost from that particular story that we tell are other genealogies. In particular, the erasure of women of color feminists, of indigenous feminisms, of post-colonial diasporic and queer feminists, who have always written more syncretic and symbiotic stories that do not privilege the human. Next slide. And so here I'm using the term queer as method. And the idea is that to queer something is to make it strange and to question what we know, why we know it and how we know it. To think, read, or act queerly is to think across boundaries, to celebrate marginality, and to destabilize the normative. Next slide. So I am speaking from Arlington, Massachusetts, from the unceded land of the native peoples of the United States. Because any serious project of decolonization must recognize, respect, and restore the enduring and rightful claims of indigenous peoples to their lands. But first, I want to ask the question, what exactly is this project of co colonialism and what did it do to our understandings of the natural world? Next slide. Here I find Leanne Simpson very useful when she says, what the colonizers have always been trying to figure out is, how do you extract natural resources from the land when the peoples whose territory you're on believe that those plant, animal, and minerals have both spirit and therefore agency? And she gives us three answers. One, you use gender violence to remove indigenous peoples and their descendants from the land. Two, you remove agency from plant and animal worlds. And three, you reposition the land as natural resources for the use and betterment of white people. And indeed the history of science and particularly the history of botany is caught up in all these three moves. Next slide. So in reconstructing history of botany, feminism, and the planet, I draw on four key theorists that I want to introduce and go through in this short talk. First, next slide, Eve Tuck. In querying our tales of life on earth, Eve Tuck insists that we must move away from damage-centered research. Research that obsessively documents pain and loss to explain the underachievement or failure. A pathologizing approach in which oppression singularly defines the community. Because these damaged narratives then become grounds for recuperative strategies for correction in order to bring marginal communities in, into normative folds of modernity. And so I take Eve Tuck seriously in saying that we ought to move away from the victim narratives we narrate during colonialism and instead think about the lost histories, the lost contributions of indigenous and formerly colonized peoples um, across the world. And what I want to do in this short talk is to use the case of invasion biology to reflect on how we might approach and envision this project of decolonizing botany. The second um, theorist is Toni Morrison, and I in particular indebted to her evocative concept she de develops in her novel, Beloved, Rememory. Next slide. And she uses this term as both a verb and a noun, which turns the present of narrative enunciation 
into the haunting memorial of what has been excluded, excised, and evicted. Next slide. Rememory, as Vivian Salehana argues, is preserved in institutions, branded upon their violently structured bureaucracies, and practiced upon the bodies of the colonized by the bodies of the colonizer. In her Black feminist ontology, the figure of the ghost neither confirms nor denies the metaphysical. In particular, the past is not merely the past, but a place to make deeper discoveries, as satisfying as they are disturbing, reaffirming our shared humanity. In Morrison, ghosts do not return, they are imminent to space. Therefore, this concept of remembering opens up the past, opens up lessons of care that violent legacies of colonialism had erased and invisibilized. It opens up registers of memory, echoing what Christina Sharp calls, next slide, wake work, a way of reflecting that avails us particular ways of re-seeing, re-inhabiting, and re-imagining the world. Remembering opens up the past, textures of lost memories in the flesh, in the sinew, in the pores of the living and the dead, the ghostly afterlives of Malthus, Darwin, and Linnaeus in restored tales for life on Earth. Next slide. So thinking about invasion biology through these histories of empire reveals a profound botanical amnesia. Empire, it turns out, is as central to non-human worlds as human worlds. Where humans went, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and viruses went along. So what if we refuse the binaries of nature and culture and rethink empire through nature cultures and trace the shared histories of colonial migration? Next slide. Indeed, environmental historians have argued that we should understand empire and imperialism as fundamentally an ecological project in which humans, plants, and other species were shuffled around the earth in schemes for colonization and conservation. In the early modern period, botany, for example, was big science and big business, critical to Europe's ambitions as a colonial trader. Colonialism ushered in a massive and grand reshuffling of global biota. Indeed, it would be accurate to characterize colonial expansion as the original bioinvasion. One can and should understand the botanical sciences as a significant, significant legacy in the afterlives of empire. Colonialism fueled an extractive economy through the objectification, commodification of the colonized world and the destruction of local knowledges. In its place, the colonial order installed the biological sciences as the universal abstract and expert knowledge. Local ecologies were transformed by colonial logics. Colonial roots of plants included the famous spice trades, lumbar resources, plantation crops, horticultural specialties, and troves of agricultural plants and animals. Horticultural societies and gardens across the West cultivated the exotic and curious. As a result, in most countries, agriculture includes predominantly foreign plants and animals. Thinking of contemporary invasion biology alongside colonial botany brings into stark focus the hubris of colonial logics. During colonial rule, there was a laissez-faire attitude for unlimited mobility across borders. Next slide. For example, in the 19th and 20th century, the US Department of Agriculture had an active program where biologists were sent as explorers to roam the earth in search of new and interesting plants of economic and aesthetic interest. Dr. Douglas Fairchild, who was director of the USDA section on seed and plant introduction, is said to have himself introduce actually over 200,000 species and varieties into the United States. Think about this, one person who brought 200,000 foreign species into the planet, and this was a government program. Next slide. As Alfred Crosby argues, the roots of European domination of the Western world lie in their creating new Europe's wherever they went. Also critical is the cost of the settler colonists ravaged native populations of human plants and animals. In the context of the history of empire, the rise of the discourse of invasive species is particularly ironic. As colonialisms ushered in new landscapes of empire, new formations of na nature cultures, nativist thinking re-engaged with national borders, with immigration and quarantine laws that restricted entry to the foreign. Indeed, the discourse of invasive species remains a prominent feature 
of the environmental afterlives of empire as waves of nationalisms consumed the post-colonial worlds and colonial nations moved to secure their borders by preventing the other from entering their nations. Here, the third theorist, Sylvia Winter, is clarifying. Next slide. In her genealogical exploration of Western thought, she identifies two key representational figures of man. Man one, a homo religiosus, who emerged from the theological order of knowledge of pre-Renaissance Latin Christian medieval Europe. A figure that opened up man two, a bourgeois figure of liberal monohumanism from the late 19th century that she calls homo economicus. Winter's figures illustrate the projects of colonialism and how academic disciplines were shaped by the logics of empire, founded on a foundational anti-blackness. Race in her conception is central to Western humanism, a foundational anti-blackness we can trace to 1492. The project of colonialism was the proliferation and naturalization of homo economicus. Next slide. So it should come as no surprise then that after centuries of global expansion and ecological decimation of the planet, as independence movements swept colonized nations, colonial nations then ushered in the original bio-invasion. Next, next slide. They retreated to their homelands and closed their borders from newer immigrants. Tracking the histories of invasive rhetoric allows us to understand how plant and animal quarantine laws developed alongside National Exclusion Acts. Next slide. Indeed, we see a national rewriting of history when the white settlers, especially in the United States, anoint themselves as the new natives, relegating all others as foreign and undesirable. There is no pristine Eden here, no purity, no corner untouched by colonialism and its afterlives and the rapacious tentacles of modernity. Indeed, while the powerful have only now discovered an impending apocalypse, the colonized have long lived through apocalyptic nightmares of settler and neo-colonialisms. Theirs is a story of survival and celebration. I re-narrate this abbreviated history to highlight both the hubris of empire and its subsequent amnesia that consolidates the colonial project and prevents us from a true botanical reckoning with our colonial past. Invasion biology is entirely a project of colonial nostalgia and return. Thinking colonialism and environmentalism together, we see how both consolidate the central enlightenment figure of Homo economicus. Next slide. This brings me to the last theorist, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa. In her Matters of Care, next slide, drawing on Donna Haraway's theories of situated knowledge, she explores how we can think with care by outlining a series of three concrete moves. First, she argues we need to think with care by acknowledging the interaction and relationality in our nature cultural world. Second, we need to dissent with by opening up models of care, especially ones that take on conflict and difference and incommensurability. Finally, she says, thinking for and warns us of the risks of fetishizing and appropriating in, in attempts to act on behalf of other humans or non-humans. She helps us understand how Homo economicus produced modern day green consumerism founded on a privatized model of care and an individualized biopolitical morality. Next slide. Together, Tuck, Morrison, Winter, and Bella Casa remind us that any botanical reckoning necessitate, necessitates methodologies of care through both a project of rememory that unravels Homo economicus and at the same time opening up old and new epistemologies and ontologies of multi species entanglements. These theorists for, force us to recognize that academic disciplines and subdisciplines developed and consolidated through colonialisms have produced infrastructures of coloniality. Nomenclatures, taxonomies, epistemologies, methodologies, and methods sanctified by enlightenment logics. Disciplines prove efficient apparatus for colonial extraction. Thus, it should not surprise us that the original colonial bioinvasion is followed by a science of invasion biology. How do we, as Eve Tuck urges us, move away from damage centered framework to a desire based framework where we don't fetishize damage and degeneration, but celebrate survival and regeneration? Here we can move from a politics of nostalgia of invasion biology to a politics of Michelle Murphy's alter life 
of Bella Casa's alter biopolitics, to move to recognizing the dynamism of nature cultures. A true biological reckoning must acknowledge that we are all migrants now, all refugees of a ravaged nature cultural past, seeking to salvage our nature cultural present and futures. The construction of natives, aliens, migrants, refugees are all political constructions of the unequal afterlives of empire. The ravages of empire have transformed not only human and cultural landscapes, but also ecological ones. So no species is well adapted anymore. We are all displaced, no longer living in worlds we grew up in, our environment no longer familiar. We are all refugees, albeit in very unequal and hierarchical worlds. The rise of the global right bespeaks a global anxiety about place. Indeed, the world that might feel like home might be thousands of miles away on another continent. Reckoning with the false borders and boundaries of nations and nationalisms are not only about human worlds, but increasingly also about our co-inhabitants of the planet, the plants that feed us, the fabrics that clothe us, and the lumber that houses us. We need to tend new methodologies of care and new nature cultural imaginations for our rural lives. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Banu, for this wonderful talk with so many thought provoking and inspiring insights. Um, yeah, we so before we get into discussion, we proceed. Um, directly with the next speaker, which will be Katimari Rosa. Katimari, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to, to start saying that this space is a very interesting space for discussion and I'm Really excited and happy to be here with all of you today. So, um, what I thought for our discussion for for us to talk a little bit today was to bring some of the connections to try to think some of the connections with physics and decolonizing thought, because as um, a physicist, a physics professor, many times I'm asked, but what this has to do with physics, what are the connections? It, sometimes it's hard for people to, to see these, um, how those things are linked. So that's what I thought um, to bring here today. Then, uh, so what we are going to talk, and then next slide, please, is about, so I organized this to talk a little bit about colonialism and then coloniality the decolonial turn. And I wanna share also some of my struggles uh, doing this work and then show how, what, what happens in my physics classroom, for example. Next, I think that it's important to, for us to not forget what, what it meant um, the colonialism for our bodies, for our culture, for our intellectual thought. And it's always important to remember that the colonial thought involved invasion, murder, and looting. Uh, next. And I am talking from Brazil. In when we think about the colonial times uh, and how European countries uh, enslaved people and trafficked them through the Atlantic. Brazil was a is a country was a country that um, had a, a very major role in all the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, next, please. When we look into the number of captives, of people that were enslaved, um, we see that a, a lot of people were trafficked to Brazil. And next slide, please. And uh, in this graphic, we can see uh, many historical 
things have happened, but in 1850, uh, Brazil had suppressed the slave trade. That's uh, number 13, more or less, in the, in the graphic. And we can see that even after that, there was slave trade uh, going on. It was happening even after it was suppressed. And next slide, please. And these, um, these spreadsheets I'm bringing, they are from the Slave Voyages Project. And uh, although hurtful, I think they are very important for us to, to understand and to sort of get in the mindset of what colonial times meant. When we look at this um, spreadsheet, this table, what we see is, you can see in the first column, it's like number one, two, three, four, and these is the number of uh, the voyage of an identification of a vessel that was trafficking people. And this list goes on. Uh, next slide, please. And then it goes on and on and on until the last one, that is this number, 900,000, uh, over 900,000 vessels. And we have this and all these things registered because people were not considered people. We were considered uh, things. Black people were not saw as people. And that is not something that is uh, far away. It is still present. So even though we uh, ended uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we ended colonialism. All the thought, all the practices, all the ways of living and understanding and relating to each other, they remain uh, for a long time. Because uh, in, in Brazil, we abolished slavery in 1888. We were the last country in the Americas to, to abolish slavery. So we have this very long time of thinking about black people as not people, as less of a human being. And when we think about uh, the end of colonial times, so we're talking about decolonial thought and ending colonialism, and then we need to have this, uh, this huge shift is so thinking about this program of complete disorder and uh, mm -hmm. using phenom uh, ideas and next slide please and phenom um we say about ending colonialism the destruction of the colonial world is no more and no less than the abolition of one zone it's burial in depths of the earth or its expulsion from the country. The natives challenge to the colonial world is not a rational confrontation of points of view. It's not a treatise on the universal, but the untidy affirmation of original idea propounded as an absolute. And next slide, please. So we managed to finish colonialism and you can say we are no longer uh, a colony. However, all, as, as I said, all of these ideas and practices, they remain and they are present now. So by that we understand as coloniality. So it's the permanence of um, all these ideas. And uh, next slide, please. And then we have some axis of coloniality that are centered in the raciality. So it's understanding that our society, our economy, our political stances, everything is founded in making, in, in racializing people and then making people being superior, one race being superior than the others. So that's something that is the foundation of our societies today. And another thing that's present today, it's part of our society, it's what funds our societies, is centralization of capital, but not only capital. Um, 
the centralization of capital includes controlling labor resources, world market, and it's we, we can see the, that in several industries, this centralization. And that connects to um, these other foundation for our society is that the need of a monocultural epistemology. So we also centralize a way of knowing, of understanding only one possibility of thinking and of being. So um, within this framework of coloniality, we construct and validate this universal way of knowing. Next, please. Next slide. Well, then um, we have. I, I bring here Minolo, Walter Minolo, to to think about how in this in the radical political and epistemological shift enacted by people like Amilcar Cabral, Aimé Césaire, Frantz Fanon, um, Gloria Zaldúa, and many other people, the the colonial shift. Uh, is this project of the linking of while post colonial criticism and theory is a project of scholarly transformation within the academy? So, we, I try to think, we try to think, what does that mean in terms of what I do as a physicist and a professor, and how do I think about this monocultural epistemology and how to link this? hundreds of years of culture in science and how can I get to know other possibilities to understand nature, to understand relationships between people even. Um, next slide, please. So when we think, uh, sometimes I, I bring here this cartoon that is a like a museum with lots of that there were lots of uh, paintings and now they're all off and the cartoon says uh, there we are 100 percent decolonized because one thing people usually think okay so now we are not going to teach physics anymore we are not going to teach physics the way we know it what are we going to do do we just take everything off and destroy all the knowledge we we have so far what what are we supposed to do and um, next slide, please. So we have been thinking and working, how can we think about the knowledge we have in physics in particular, but in science in general, and in which ways they, they are based in this colonial practices and this uh, understanding of the world. And so I, this is a book that's only in Portuguese. So, uh, but I'm showing here a possibility. So it's a possibility for, for turning, for changing, uh, in an epistemological perspective. And in this book that a, a colleague and I organized, we propose several possibilities for the classroom. So we have, we organized several uh, texts and discussions on how to think about knowledge and science education in a decolonial um, way. And this work was created in a collaborative way. So it was uh, horizontal, that we have several authors working on that, it was collaborative, and we had group feedback, which is also a different way of thinking how we can produce knowledge in academy. And I have to say it is localized. So, and, and I said, this is, it, it is in Portuguese and it was thought within the Brazilian reality. And we understand that um, we cannot spread everything to everywhere. We, we, we disagree with this idea that um, projects, especially educational projects, they are supposed to be used all over the world. And that's a very um, way of thinking in terms of centrality. So it's centralizing knowledge, centralizing 
ways of doing or redoing things. And we believe it's important to locally uh, understand with local groups, local people, original people uh, from the land, what can we do? And we can learn from that work with other groups in other areas, but it's not possible to just use the same ways of uh, knowing and learning all over the world. That's a very um, colonial way of thinking, we understand. Um, and this work is also tentative. So we have lots of theories in terms of decolonial thought, but how does it work in, in, in actual classroom? We have to try. So it's a tentative work. We don't have an answer for how to do that in physics and biology and chemistry and we keep trying. And I, uh, next slide please. I, I, I brought here some, and again, they are in Portuguese here. I haven't translated, um, but I'm going to translate for you. Some of the topics so you can have an idea of what kinds of things we are discussing when you're thinking about decolon decolonizing science. So these are, so the, this one here is bio, decolonial biology, life and genocide of black youth. So we discuss um, about the, the, in this perspective of genocide because black youth in Brazil as in many other countries, uh, we suffer with the police, uh, police violence and so we discuss that from what is life, what it means to discuss life in biology. Um, this other one is a proposal to decolonize the Pythagoras theorem in, in math, because so we bring all this knowledge, this mathematical knowledge that was shared by many people before the Greek and the concept of the theorem of Pythagoras was already present um, before Pythagoras and we don't learn that. So bringing all this knowledge from African people, in, in this case, we bring from Egyptians, but also from Babylonians and other groups that had this knowledge, the, the concept of the Pythagorean theorem and then we discuss that. Uh, this other one, and I'll be um, quicker now, it's about um, melanin. So in chemistry, so we use chemistry to discuss melanin and black, uh, and the, the tone of skin. The other one, it's about um, the Yoruba myth and how we can think about right and, and identity and so using this Yoruba perspective. And this last one is the is does the structure racism has has a cure? Is it possible? So this is an inter interdisciplinary um, work on the use of psychotropics by black incarcerated women. So it's it, it's a beautiful <laughs> work and it, other ways to think about chemistry and psychedelics and how it relates with incarceration. And then, oh, next please. So that was uh, a volume one of this book and we are now in the volume two that we uh, launched last year. And this book uh, in the country, so we have this, Physics, um, so it's a bookstore and a publisher, uh, and, and the name is Physics Publisher, which is a major physics and science publishing in Brazil. And this book, The Colonizing Knowledge, uh, was their most, uh, the, the one that had the, the most sales. Um, and we were very happy about that because people really crave here in Brazil, we are in this moment where that we are craving, like, what do we do? Because we discuss a lot of things, but what do we do? How can we think um, about the colonial possibilities? And so now we have this volume two that has also um, other, many other works. And one thing that I wanna 
I'm gonna say that now we are discussing love and what does it mean and looking for a philosophical perspective. It's it's very beautiful how things change. Um, so can we please next slide? And but we have struggles in doing that. Next slide, please. And I want to show you very quickly, so that's just for finishing, but I want to show one thing that is I can I use in my physics classroom uh, when I'm teaching electromagnetic electromagnetism, for example. Uh, next and next, please. And next. Yes. So this uh, slide I showed you in, in the beginning about the number of captives. And then next slide, please. So this is the same slide, but with contributions from physics, because it's it was in the same time that this was happening that we are developing these concepts in physics, and we think all those things are very distant. All the the way of thinking from the colonial times are very distant, but they are very present, as are those physics concepts. And to think also about the time we are now, while we are doing lots of accomplishments in science and technology, at this very same time, there are many people in the world that are being trafficked, that are suffering, and how the technology and how the things we do now uh, are connected with this uh, abuse of people with this oppression of people around the world. And I just want to finish the, the last one, please. Is I, I want to finish with this image to show that's important for us to create spaces for um, indigenous people, for black people, for people that are traditionally uh, oppressed for us to connect and to form this uh, academic opportunity to create and to think outside of the, the, the normative and the, the majority. So, and I, I wanted to share those pictures of academics and people uh, sharing affection and knowledge and I wanted to, to finish here. So we can talk more later. Yeah, thank you very much, Katimari, for this inspiring talk and also your interesting thoughts. So, and and how we could teach science differently, and also on this, touching this epistemic issues of uh, epistemic injustices, and. Um, so I, I would do to the audience make a short reminder. So if you have questions and if you want to pose questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and please indicate um, to whom uh, the question is directed or if it should be addressed to um, to all three of our speakers. And uh, we come now to our third speaker, which is uh, Paola Ricuate Quijano. And uh, Paola, I, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for convening this dialogue, this transnational dialogue. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to um, to talk uh, about these topics. Uh, it's now. Um, a, a very common topic of discussion in many, many, many fields. So, uh, I really appreciate uh, the previous presentations because um, they give us a framework to start. So, I want, uh, I will go um, over some slides and, and because uh, Dr. Rosa already explained some of the issues that I was going to cover, I will just go over that. and. I really appreciate also uh, Professor Bano's um, provocation on on uh, imagining and and building new narratives to speak about these issues. So uh, that said, uh, this is the the basic structure of my talk. I, as I said, I will try to be very brief in order to have time to. 
to talk uh, and discuss some of these um, these issues with you. So the first is baselines, and and as I said, as Professor Rosa already explained many of the things that I was going to speak about, I will just go over very quickly. Um, there are different terminologies to speak about the decolonial framework. There is the decolonial framework, the postcolonial, and some people speak about the anti-colonial. I just would like to say that um, uh, these frameworks, um, these frameworks have different genealogies and do imply do have different implications. Um, but in any case, being uh, using the decolonial or the postcolonial uh, framework implies an anti-colonial uh, positionality. Uh, just to say that, because some sometimes people say, I, I'm not decolonial, I'm anti-colonial. But decoloniality implies a process, an ongoing process. So it's it's uh, anti-coloniality implies, of course, a positionality, but decoloniality implies that it's a process. So the second thing I would like to say is that the decolonial framework um, highlights how uh, systems of violence are interconnected. So we speak about the main uh, systems of violence, colonialism, colonialism, and, and of course, I won't speak uh, more about this. I uh, just want to say that uh, the, uh, colonialism is uh, 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 implies racism, because sometimes, again, people try to separate this. Colonialism implies racism. Cap capitalism as well, as Cedric Robinson says, Capitalism is also a racist process. And uh, as decolonial feminist would say, uh, capitalism is also associated with a patriarchal order. So we cannot uh, separate these three uh, huge or big systems of uh, violence. And as the activist, uh, the queer activist Maria Galindo uh, from Bolivia says, there is no decolonization without depatriarchalization. And uh, as I said before, there is no decolonization without an anti-racist praxis. And there is no decolonization without epistemic justice that is in turn associated with social justice. So um, the third uh, baseline is uh, that we cannot separate theory from praxis. Uh, the decolonial pro uh, project uh, is at the same time um, a theoretical framework, but also uh, a theory of change and a political uh, project. So if we are going to embrace the decolonial framework, we should be aware that it implies a social and political commitment. Um, the fourth thing uh, that I would like to begin with is to um, state what does it mean in terms of focus and positionality. And uh, when we speak about the decolonial framework, we also speak about centering uh, the life experience of the subjects of colonization. And as Professor Rosa said, of course, we are speaking here, uh, colonization as a um, present process for some people in the planet and also about coloniality, uh, also as an ongoing uh, experience. And um, some of these mechanisms that are being used to decenter the experience of uh, colonized uh, subjectivities is the absorption of experience, North planning, and tokenization. So. Those are some of the mechanisms used to uh, make invisible or uh, or situate uh, the subjects of colonization in a, a subordinate position. So, for me, it's important to be aware that it's not enough to discuss about decolonization uh, or decoloniality if institutions, practices, and relationships. Uh, reinforce mechanisms of exclusion. Um, and as I said before, uh, my my 
argument here is that decoloniality is a political praxis. So the second uh, the second section is about this idea um, that coloniality is associated with uh, modernity, and also I will uh, go over some examples. Uh, how does coloniality reproduces like in the current uh, moment and present? Uh, some of the mechanisms are associated with the production of images and representations of the world. Uh, also, the idea of development that is associated with economic growth, um, unlimited economic growth and consumption, and wealth and economic success as foundations uh, of, of uh, modernity and development, despite the destruction of the planet. Um, modernity has this desirable outcome of society, uh, opposed to those who are not modern. Um, the idea of uh, having rich countries versus poor countries without making reference to uh, the historical processes that uh, were the basis of this wealth. Also, the use of metaphors that contribute to reinforce the inferiority of the South. Um, the recognition of valid, what is valid knowledge uh, opposed to knowledge that is not valid or not scientific or not recognized by uh, privileged knowledge uh, production circles. Uh, the recognized centers of knowledge production. And if you see, this is uh, this is a study, it's, it's an old study developed by the Oxford Inter Institute and it's called uh, Information Geographies. Um, so again, uh, top universities in the world are basically, basically uh, located in the geographic north. Here is the equator, this red line. Um, and also industrialized nations, unlimited model of consumption um, that is causing the destruction of the planet. So the question is, how can we dismantle power asymmetries that exclude world's knowledges, racialized bodies and destroying nature? And here I totally agree with the position that uh, part of the this idea of separating nature and, and humanity is is. Uh, one of the causes, the root causes of, of this um, uh, exploitation of, of the environment. Um, and my area of, of interest is technology and, and data. And I have worked a lot on trying to connect the current system of, of knowledge production with um, hegemonic epistemologies on on data and technology that are associated mainly with uh, emerging technologies like uh, inter artificial intelligence. So for me, um, it's important, the decolonial framework is important because it allows us to understand the nexus between knowledge production, power, and being, and being, and being, uh, feeling, um, knowing, um, living, doing things in the world, which sustains an endless war against specific bodies, uh, knowledge, cultures, peoples, and territories. So this is a representation of the Ajuk territory uh, by uh, Lilia Perez. And in this representation, for example, the notion of territory is completely different from the, the idea of territory that is uh, dominant in Western cultures. In this idea of territory, territory is composed by um, many elements uh, that are alive. The mountains, the uh, not only the, the surface of the land, but also what's uh, like in the sub, uh, I don't know how to say that in, in, in English, uh, but, it, but it's uh, not in surface. Um, and, and how, for example, this idea of territory is opposed to the idea of the territory that is managed by the Mexican state, for example, and how the Mexican state uh, reproduces again, this, um, 
colonial epistemologies on 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 land and resources that endanger uh, the life of of communities uh, in in indigenous communities in Mexico. So epistemic violence legitimates and habilitates other forms of violence. So as I said before, epistemic violence is uh, is what sustains uh, other forms of violence is associated with uh, social injustice. So violence is naturalized and institutionalized in the production of knowledge, knowledge and also, of course, in the production of technology. Uh, technology. So knowledge systems or knowledge assemblages are um, um, a set of uh, institution norms, practices, cultures, uh, languages uh, that reproduce, again, this idea of uh, a certain type of knowledge being superior than others. Uh, also create systems of authority who is, uh, who are those who are able to produce knowledge and to be heard and to speak uh, opposed uh, to those who are made invisible by the system. Um, there's an author that speaks about uh, epistemically produced invisibility and, and it, it, this creation of systems of authority is part of, of this uh, systemic production of invisibility. And also um, the definition of intersubjective relations and the, the way that these relations are uh, in now, in, in our current times, mediated by social technical systems. So uh, in, in the territory called Avia Yala, or that we like to call Avia Yala, many um, communities uh, speak about the impossibility of separating uh, the body and the territory. Body territory is a unified category to identify that uh, we as uh, human beings are connected uh, to the land, but again, the land or the territory is not a physical construct, but a set of relationships that are uh, made possible by uh, certain uh, certain values and 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 ways of, of understanding how this interconnectedness uh, operates, operates as the foundation of what uh, are we as human uh, beings. And there's also the development of infrastructures. And in this sense, um, I always try to connect this idea of the body uh, and territory as um, a continuum where uh, now, uh, in this uh, hegemonic model of development, is mediated by the production of uh, infrastructures, technologies, or artifacts. So we have, uh, for example, um, telecommunication infrastructures, we have uh, networks and standards and protocols, and we also have uh, software applications. Um, but all these social technical systems, again, are a part of this um, model that reproduces uh, these global social symmetries. Um, what are the limits uh, of the decolonial framework? Um, and what are the challenges that we face uh, when we speak about uh, making the coloniality a, a political praxis or transforming our uh, decolonial framework into political practice? And this is a quote from Yasnaya Aguilar. Yasnaya Aguilar is a researcher and a linguist and a activist from the Mije community in Oaxaca. And she writes uh, about this idea that um, Western modernity um, 
is uh, using technology as one of the main tools to destroy the planet. So she says it is a myth of the West choosing perpetual economic growth, advancing through a digestive system of sorts, one that uses technology as one of its core components. In its turn, ecosystem became good, became goods, people more consumers. The myth turned the world into a place increasingly inhospitable to human life. So um, I said that the extractive logic that is embedded in social technical system seeks to grab the essential spheres for the sustaining of life. So again, we cannot disconnect this technopolitical project um, from this extractive notion uh, and the impact on the ecosphere. So who is bearing the cost of this hegemonic technological development? Uh, we see in, in our communities, uh, well, our communities are facing territorial occupation, water, land, and air pollution. They are being displaced. We also see labor exploitation, poor health, and poor living conditions. We see the increasing knowledge gap and infrastructural inequality, the processes of data extractivism, the epistemic erasure of people uh, conducting to epistemicide, and also the undermined democracy and authoritarianism. Uh, and of course, physical death. So this model uh, based in unlimited consumption and maximization of profit uh, needs mineral extraction, needs unfair labor, uh, also uh, makes invisible the supply chain, the cost of uh, transporting and making these tools, technologies available for people. They also make invisible the cost, for example, of uh, training machine learning models, which is now the new um, technology used to, um, again, um, reproduce this, this uh, model of development. Uh, the, the environmental cost of uh, maintaining data centers and the technological dumps that are uh, mainly located, located in uh, countries of the global south. So these processes of datafication, algorithm mediation, out and automation that are part of the new narratives of development and economic um, models, uh, global economic models, uh, generate social orders of classification and knowledge orders that lead to epistemic, economic, social, cultural, and environmental inequality. So what's the response of some of the communities uh, in um, in the territory of Abiel? Yal and I will come back to the proposal of, of um, Yasnaya Aguilar. And, and they say that we, need, we don't need to invent anything new. We just need to learn and listen from communities that have been uh, struggling and fighting against, against this extractivist model for centuries. So one of the practices that is rooted in many of our communities is the practice that in Mexico is called tequio. In Andean countries, I, I'm from Ecuador, an Andean country, uh, it's called minga. Uh, or in countries well, like Brazil, it's called, please correct me, Catamari uh, So these different ways of expressing how uh, communal work is uh, the way to achieve a, a shared goal is part of the idea that uh, Jasna Aguilar puts forward in her proposal of, of developing technologies. So technologies are the result of this communal work, but also are um, reinforcing the idea that uh, communities should fight for their autonomy, so sovereignty, uh, with values that are opposed to capitalist values or the values of the market uh, that are communal and that are sustainable. Uh, but this is not new, of course. What she says is that this is the way that they have, they have been surviving against these um, necropolitics that is uh, 
uh, imposed as the desirable model of the world. Uh, and going back to the idea of ethics and politics, there are many frameworks that are associated with uh, ethics that are not rooted in uh, violence. And for example, Sueli Rolnik speaks about the ethics of existence uh, as, as <laughs> was previously mentioned, the ethics of, her, of care. But also there uh, are other frameworks. Um, there is the ethics of conviviality. And what is the correspondent praxis or the correspondent politics? Um, some of the feminist um, authors speak about politics of shared responsibility, or as Karen Brad says, responsibility, that is our capacity to respond to these um, systems of violence, but also about restoration, reparation, and the guarantee of non-repetition. So to finish, uh, I would, uh, Again, would like to finish with another quotation from Yasna Aguilar, and she says that technology as a take you, uh, technological creation and innovation as a common good, a kind of open source software we call we can all participate in, just as we as we have participated in the construction of our lives as the colonized people of this continent, resisting genocide and extinction. In the face of our current global climate emergency, we need to foster forms of technological development that emphasize living with dignity, not infinite economic growth as an end in itself. We must focus on technologies based on a collaborative labor more than on competition. As peoples of Avia Yala, we're experienced in this strategy, which I call techology. If the world were to listen to the people of Avia Yala and adopt this new technological vision, we could perhaps escape the digestive system that so threatens our world's climate and endangers human life. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this stimulating talk and also these so many eye-opening insights. Um, we wanted to start the discussion um, among you three, so respectively, so starting the actual dialogue part of the event. And um, so the idea was, or the proposition is that you as speakers are invited to refer to each other's talks and discuss your perspectives. And so maybe where can you connect to each other? Um, maybe there are also points where you would disagree and um, yeah. So, and anyone who wants to start or to share impressions or thoughts? So, I will, maybe I will start here. Yeah, Thank okay. you both. These were really, there was such great presentations, so much to think about. Um, I just wanted to bring up this issue of, you know, when you both of you talked about decolonial, postcolonial, anticolonial, and just coming from the Indian context of how troubling the anticolonial has become there, mostly because we have seen the rise of Hindu nationalists who are using the language of anti-colonialism um, as a way to marginalize and oppress religious minorities, sexual minorities. Um, and so it's, for me, it's, it's increasingly becoming um, a difficult term because they claim to be, they are anti-colonial, right? They, they claim to be fighting the past, but the ways in which they, um, how they define colonialism and what they see as anti-colonialism is very different. I don't know if you have seen similar moves happening in other sites and how we might address that. Well, uh, yeah, of, of course, uh... These are the dangers that we are facing, and as I said, um, 
if we don't understand the interconnectedness of, of the systems of violence and how this this project is also being captured by many actors, not only governments, <laughs> but also other actors like corporations and <laughs> and I don't know privilege of academics also in, in industrialized countries. That that's why I, I began uh, saying that we need to be very careful when we use this framework and to say how are we understanding the decolonial framework because as you said many governments can use this as a political um project and there is an author a mexican author that spoke about internal colonialism and i think it's very interesting because um i, I wrote a, a paper on this and and the global order creates these narratives and uh, produces these systems, institutions, norms, whatever. But colonial governments in our countries take these narratives and use those narratives to again uh, reproduce the same violence against m minorities. And that's why uh, communities in Mexico are fighting against the government because the state has historically tried to exterminate this population. So um, for me, it's important to understand how these different um, processes are inter interconnected at different levels at the global order. Then what's the uh, the use that our governments have of these projects and then how communities are resistant to those different um, systems uh, and layers. So, yeah, there is absolutely um, a danger uh, there. But again, um, I would say that's why it's important to state first, what are we trying to, what's our project and what are we fighting against and why we reject the use of these terms and frameworks just to, uh, yeah, for ethical washing or um, as I sometimes say, um, yeah, uh, being politically correct in in different spheres, but yes, there is that we have this this problem now. <laughs> I think it's it's a general problem. Yeah, and there are many in the Indian context who say nationalism is a bigger issue than the frameworks of decolonization in terms of how it's playing out there. But yeah, no, no, thank you for that. So, Katumari, um, do, do you want to add or to comment or maybe bring another issue at the fore? Yeah, yeah, well, not exactly um, to add something to that, but I was thinking about how, um, again, thinking about context and local realities, how that is um, important to for those discussions because we tend to I think we we tend to uh think how how we can expand some notions or concepts globally this this whole idea about global or being for everyone that um can that could be problematic so when we look into uh each context specifically um we can have a better understanding. So when we are talking, it, so in this case, just just thinking out loud here, but it, it's it's important as as you brought here um, the the how are things being played out in India in the Indian context and how those uh, those concepts are being used. So it's not just about the concept or the wording or what can we do but what exactly is being done there because the same wording or ideas in another context uh, can, can have a, a, a different outcome um, if that makes sense what i'm saying is like 
it, it's hard to in in a way we are doing here this a uh, transnational conversation um because we have to talk of course but we also have to to keep in mind all these particularities that we have um and uh, it's it's finding common ground in terms of practices and experiences, but the words and the wording sometimes they 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 they, they, they can trick us. Uh, and Muchido is fine. Muchido, uh, oh, it, it is Muchido, and, and it's interesting. I, I found it very interesting how we end up talking about this community thing. In the end, and how the, the local community. So the Muchido, this idea of Muchido comes very much, at least in Portuguese, using uh, thinking about the word Muchido as it were. So how I I understood that what you're saying, uh, not just local, but like grassroots. So it's not just about the local context, but who's doing that and with what purpose. And I don't know. I, I saw so many connections. It's a, I, I don't. Want to, I want to talk too much. But when you're talking, the first talk you're talking about botanics, and then I was thinking about you know we have a new government here in Brazil, and um, we are having people in the we have we are having right now this huge crisis with the Yanomami people, the indigenous Yanomami people, and then I was thinking, uh, and and we are discussing about how. Uh, indigenous people from Brazil, they are their practices preserve obviously <laughs> nature, um, and and this view also about how we are part of the how everything is connected. This this whole idea of this connection of human body and nature is is, is so um, it comes with modernity, and it's not it, it it's a concept that some groups here cannot. Imagine it's 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 another way of thinking and um and I found that how interesting in a way all the three of us were connected <laughs> and so that's what we'll say it's not really something to uh, to respond to but I was thinking oh this is really very cute and you're like oh this looks like we planned something like <laughs> yeah so. Just wanted to add that. Yeah, um, yeah, please feel free to if you have any other issues or, or comments. Um, so otherwise, so we will have one question um in the chat um it's from uh, so i i think i will read it it's from harita holbrook and uh, she wrote thank you for these three wonderful presentations um i appreciate the emphasis on local solutions versus universals so the decolonization is a process Banwe has been creating space within sds for silenced voices for a long time, as said Katimari in physics. I'm less familiar with Dr. Vicari's work, but now I know more. Given that local versus universal, I still ask the following. What is your one takeaway message that has been the most successful at shaking up the status quo and getting your intellectual communities to shift their thinking? So maybe you want to respond to this. So good to see you. We go back all the way from UCLA. I've known her for a long time. I, to me, I feel that some of the most interesting work seems to be um, happening in museums and herbarium, you know, in the sense of that they are the most proximate places where all the looting that happened. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, talking about decolonizing um, in terms of botany. I think there's some work happening in changing the names 
right? So, so many of the names, uh, plant names are often, you know, colonizers, white colonizers names that came in there. So some talk about um, sort of changing that. But, you know, the more I've delved into it, these infrastructures are so, so, so deep <laughs> that there are, you know, this sort of colonialism is kind of you know, sedimented. There are layers and layers and layers. So, for example, people talking about, you know, all that we know of the botanical genome. So much of what we know is what they call parachute science. So, Western scientists will parachute onto former colonized countries, take the plants they need, come back, grind them up, and then publish them. Right? So, it's, so it's, it's really entirely a colonial process that still continues now. But um, I think there, they, there are beginning to be discussed, both in terms of formerly colonized countries saying, no, we are not going to give you our DNA. We are not going to give you our plants. Um, but even there, the terms of the dialogue is always Western. So if there is, for example, a, a, a drug, a potentially a curative drug, um, to f then someone in the West patents it. So then it has to be fought in a Western legal context. So to some extent, so the colonial infrastructure is so very deep, um, in, you know, in the ways in which to um, any project, forget decolonizing, you know, that even getting credit, even opening this up becomes so very difficult because these infrastructures that remain um, come from such colonial frameworks. And so third world countries that don't have a lot of money have to fight. Uh, patents in international court, which is very, very expensive. Thank you, Dorita, for your um, wonderful question. Um, for me, it's it's again, it's it's trying as 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 Manu said. Um, is trying to make visible all these layers in in what we do um, and trying to change uh, at least what is in our hands, the way we do things and the questions we ask, the relations that we uh, foster um, that need to be, yeah, that, that need to, to be, our, our dialogues, our dialogues should should be in different terms. And as I said, uh, one of the things that we are trying to do with um, with the communities that I work with um, is to think about the idea of responsibility, of shared responsibility. And for me, it's important to again go beyond the idea of solidarity, of feminist solidarity, which is great. But I think that when you have people that are responsible for things, and, and we are all responsible for things in our positions of privilege, what should be our answer? How can we change the terms of the discussion? How can you change the relationships that we build? And in, in the work that I do, it's been so interesting when, for example, we try to define uh, different uh, different relationships, different ways of doing things that are not intended to be uh, to, or to respond to these narratives of uh, productivity or um, yeah or or that are not inscribed in this uh, general discourse of science and knowledge production. We try to do things that are meaningful to us and that are meaningful to the communities that we work with. So it's it's hard, but at least it's rewarding to see that there that these terms can be changed. And again, politics of citation, the people that we read, the people that we quote, the people that um, we invite to talk, the conditions that we facilitate to make these voices present in the discussion, in the global debates. I, it, again, I'm super against those initiatives that use the decolonial framework just as a fade or just because it's 
it's some something fashionable at these days and do not have a real political action plan to reverse power asymmetries. So I'm against those ideas that say, well, decoloniality is about the plurality of knowledge without changing anything. That's why I spoke about tokenization or North, North Plain. I have found, uh, well, we have, all have experienced that probably. Uh, I cannot exist without being like, I cannot, uh, yeah, I cannot be a legitimate knowledge producer because I'm not a white man. So if someone wants to quote me, they just have to quote first my uh, male white uh, colleagues that work in the same fields that I work um, and things like that. So there, there are many things that we can change. Um, and I think it's just about thinking about uh, of those small actions in, in these different spheres. Oh, I will say, I, I will maybe join this with answering, I guess, someone else that asked about um, activism and uh, academic work. And as the, the, the pictures I, I added in the end of my presentation, um, they had a little bit of this activism part. Because so for me, um, in my practice, what I have, what I'm experiencing as being, so answering to Jarita, um, one thing is to, to make ourselves stronger. So to join others like us and to help us grow um, out of this colonial mindset, uh, this uh, patriarchy and this racist um, mindset, because we are all raised in within the society. We display practices that are similar to those, that it's, it's hard to break, to recognize the things we do and to break that. So it's, uh, for me, what is being perhaps uh, successful is not the word, but uh, that has a good, I see impact is that is strengthening ourselves. So others like myself, understanding uh, what it means in my case to be a black woman in the society and uh, connecting with other black folks in here and seeing what we do to reinforce oppressions in society because we do things that reinforce oppression. So um, being aware of this, and I don't think it is possible to disconnect activist work from academic work in this sense. So it's those things are really together. And I see that mostly together when it comes from the work of people of color. Um, here, at least from my experiences, uh, people of color are doing this work as an academic and activist. It, it's almost the other discussion about body and nature. It's it it's it's not possible to think those things as disconnected. Um, uh, just one one thing. So to to add in terms of a practical thing, also answering Jarita, having. Jarita, for example, here, um, as she was, uh, she once came here to, to Brazil and she was the first black woman um, to be the keynote speaker in um, a physics event here in Brazil. And it's, it, it was something huge, the fact that we had someone that's a physicist and that, uh, was a black woman, and we we are a country with a majority of black population, and we, and we have never had that before. So those things are very important, and those things are practice too. Um, 
Um, so we have also two more questions um, in the chat. So you three, if you want to pick one question up. So I, I want to let it to you if if you want to ask. I think I can speak about this idea of language. I think language is powerful because again, it's the code. Uh, it's the code and and as a code is is being created by someone and it's defined by someone. So we should change that code. Oh and and this code in, in, in like natural language, we speaking English and if you don't speak English, you don't exist or you cannot think because you don't you don't you cannot produce knowledge because you don't speak English. That's one thing. And and the other thing is the the academic language, the code in which you should speak to be considered an academic. That's also something that should be changed. Um and going back to the idea of, of act activism and academia. I I myself do not define as an academic. Uh, I I have been working uh, as an activist for many years. Um, uh, it's my my I would say my my a political commitment and, and I I'm in the academia because that's the place I found a job, but uh, I consider myself uh, myself an activist. And and for me, it's it's again, it's it's you have to be able to change the code and and to transform the code in order to be useful for people. We don't need academics that are completely separated from their realities and whose work does not transform those institutions. Um, as I said, those relationships, those codes that are hegemonic and that are created to exclude specific people. So if we are not aware of the use of language to exclude people in academia, but of course, from other places too, then we are not understanding the role of knowledge production and the role of, of language in, in representing those asymmetries. So I think that they use the understanding of language as, as a code that again is used to reproduce exclusions is, is fundamental to change that use of, of language in academic settings, but also like in general settings. I just wanted to add another layer to that. Um, I completely agree with what you're saying is the other thing I experience is that in the sciences, um, I think when we train scientists, we do not explain how important language is and that language carries history, it carries meaning, it carries politics. So very often, for example, on invasive species, biologists will come and say, I agree, it's a very xenophobic term and it's terrible. Tell me what other word can I use? And I have to explain the problem is not the word. The problem is that we divide the world into, you know, natives and foreigners. <laughs> and it becomes a litmus test on what is a good plant and a bad plant. The problem is not just words. It's the conceptual framework in how we divide the world. And so I think in, in the sciences, I think we need a better education that words are not just words. Words are laden with meaning and history and politics and power. And I wish we could find a way of communicating that in the science classroom. So uh, there in, in the chat is another question. So um, um, I, I will read it. 
Um, how closely do you work with activists? So I think we, we have a little bit of a response to it. My impression is that in Germany, academia and activism are quite separate and therefore discussions can go in diverging directions and we don't support each other as much as we possibly could. So just in case that anyone wants to um, uh, to comment on this. I also wanted to echo what uh, Paola was saying earlier that sometimes we always think of activism as outside the academy when so much of the work of decolonization has to happen also within the academy, within the structures of knowledge, within the methods we use, in how we teach. I mean, so I, uh, you know, the presentations here have been so wonderful and Katamari especially talking about how we can teach differently, how we can bring different kinds of knowledge into the classroom. So I think it's we should also decolonization has to happen everywhere, not just outside academia, but also within. Yeah, that's exactly right. There is no quick fix. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, when preparing this event and also having heard your inputs and listening to your discussions, so and um, so that's also about changing the day-to-day -day practices in science and research and in teaching and uh, we have also been asking ourselves so um let's say concerning the western science system so what kind of structural changes would be needed also in the in this respect of so that we would need a kind of political um action plan um yeah so so i i just was to bring this topic um, onto the floor. So, if you want to comment on this, so just in case. Um, I I can uh, comment quickly. Uh, there's one thing uh, Paolo was saying about uh, academic production about not. Of falling into the, the logic of productivism in academia, right? You mentioned something like that. And because <clears throat> I'm thinking about the, the, the production is it's in everything. So when we have to, to rethink our economies, what do we fund? What do we give money for? How we think about our relationship with uh, farming, for example, and uh, what kind of production of um, food we are going to do in the world and what type of production of technology and uh, in, in what speed what we are doing that. We don't need to do things like to do more and more and fast. We need to do enough to have for everyone and that changes what uh, what we are going to give money for. Right? So where we are going to put our money, are we going to put our money into things that are going to produce more or faster uh, or things that are more sustainable or respectful with people and um, the planet and everyone and, the, and a diverse way of knowing, meaning uh, it's not just one type of knowledge that's going to be um, funded, that's going to get money. Um, so that counts for publication, it counts for farming, and counts for everything. And the things we buy in terms of technology. So I just wanted to add that into like what, in practical, we live in a capitalist society and money counts a lot. So where are we going to put our money? Yeah, 
So are there any more issues, comments, maybe also questions in the chat? So then this would be so more or less so the last opportunity. Yes, I let you type, of course. So um, I, I dare to read just the bodies, we invite diverse bodies into the academy, but they will have violence done to them. Yes. Uh, I will add to that very quickly because I just was talking about this yesterday that uh, all the bodies, those bodies that are going to suffer violence in the, in the academy, they are already suffering violence in other spaces. So we need to change the academy, yes, but it's this, these bodies are already uh, experiencing violence. Um, I just wanted to, to add this. It's not an answer, I just, it's just a comment. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree with you there, but I think it's also, um, it, this is maybe a very United States um, issue of all the efforts that go into women in science and minorities in science and engineering, and it's all a mathematical, you know, how many more diverse bodies we can get in there. But along with that is in this question of, you know, why are we bringing more and more people into Violence also, I agree, Yo, there's violence elsewhere and inside that alongside that has to be a questioning of science and the culture of science and the climate of science. So we don't, you know, bring people in and then celebrate. It's like, oh, our numbers are high, but in fact, what's happening is a great deal of violence. So that these efforts have to go alongside not only giving so-called marginal people the tools to survive, but to change the culture so they don't have to survive, that this can be a place that is nurturing and where people can thrive. Totally agree with, with uh, what you said. Um, and going back to the idea of, of structural challenges uh, and systemic uh, changes, that uh, systemic changes that we need. Uh, again, we, we are not aiming to to just uh, achieve a, a, a quota of diversity quota, increasing the numbers. Uh, what we are saying is that uh, the infrastructures of knowledge production are systemically erasing people. So if we don't change that um, knowledge, that, that knowledge production systems, and if we don't understand how these knowledge production systems are intertwined with economic systems and also social technical systems because that's also my point then we want uh achieve a real transformation so we need to work on those issues in parallel as a systemic problem so we are not going to change anything if we just like again use this um strategy of tokenization uh, and inviting people to uh, diverse people to join us, uh, but maintaining like them uh, without changing any uh, any structure uh, of power. Uh, so that's that's the thing that we need to be thinking about. <laughs> 